Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening's live stream. My name is John. I am the Tattooed Historian. Thank you so much for being on this evening. Tonight we have a co-person that needs to come on here because the conference was canceled for History Camp, and that's Brittany Ingersoll. Uh, Brittany is the curator of the Cumberland County Historical Society in Greenwich, New Jersey, and she had a fabulous topic, and I think I met you on Instagram, right? Was that how we met originally, Brittany? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I bought a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah. You bought a t-shirt. That's right. You bought a t-shirt and uh, I looked on your Instagram because I wanted to see who you were <laughs> and, and which I get nosy like that. I'm wondering who's buying my merch. And I saw that you had a history camp uh, flyer up and then I realized that it was canceled and I saw what you had proposed doing and I'm like, that's a killer topic. So I'm Thank so you. glad that you accepted uh, my invitation to come on and, and talk this evening. Thank you for having me. Oh, sure. Absolutely. And uh, I, I want to start out with some, you know, background on you first, before we dive into this awesome topic that you have picked out for us. Uh, so, Brittany, I have to ask, why, why history? What made you want to get into history? Um, well, I started out as a religion major when I started at my county college, and then I had this professor that... Um, totally just made history come alive for me. Mm. It wasn't this um, like concrete concern over dates and stuff, but the stories and the lives of people. And then, so uh, a year into my college, into uh, my college, and then I changed uh, to history. And then I just never went changed after that. <laughs> you never went back after that. <laughs> so it was one professor just changed your outlook on it. Yep, he just awesome. made it come to life. That's awesome. That's awesome. How has that uh, brought you to this moment in your in your career path? What what has that led to for you? Um, it has. Uh, from there, I started volunteering at my. I was living in Vineland at the time, and I started volunteering at the Vineland Historical Society. And um, my job, my current job, was actually hiring for a part time person to just come in and put their card catalog into uh, Past Perfect. Mm -hmm. And then, so I got hired there and then I, uh, they hired me full time after graduating with my graduate degree. Wow. Past perfect. I haven't heard that <laughs> in a while. That's been, that brings back fond <laughs> memories of graduate school right there. Past perfect. That's awesome. How, how, uh, how much foot traffic before the pandemic would the historical society get? Would you get a lot of people coming in and out through there? Um, we're in a smaller, we're in, uh, Greenwich is very tiny and we're kind of off the beaten path. Uh, you're coming to Greenwich uh, because you're coming to Greenwich. Okay. Um, so we would be, our events are huge. People come to our large events all the time. And then some of our smaller events are very well attended as well. Mm -hmm. um, and surprisingly, like the li I we consist of four museums and then a library and I'm stationed at the library and we're open three days a week. And surprisingly, um, it's open Wednesday, Saturday and Sunday and Wednesday is the most popular day, which always surprises me. <laughs> wow, that is, that is, I think it'd be Saturday. It would be the most popular. Yeah. Wow, it's Wednesday, okay. That's awesome. What's a piece of local history that you just love that really gets you like motivated to learn more? Um, so we are the County Historical Society. So even though um, we're stationed in Greenwich, most of my research, I like to look into Bridgeton uh, because it was such an, it's, I mean, still is, but it was such an ur urban area um, in the 19th century. And so I always find these really almost random characters that kind of get lost in history. Um, like there was this one guy uh, who owned a museum full of like um, animals and he just reminds me of P.T. Barnum. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So he's like a big taxidermy guy. Yeah, yeah. And he would like travel around and then he did like magician shows in the area. And Wow. Sounds like my kind of guy. He's an eccentric. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, he was back well trained. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So what led you to want to talk about your topic, which you were going to talk about at history camp with uh, the, the brothel guides, advertising masculinity? What, what got you to that point? Um, so when I first transferred to Rutgers Camden to complete my bachelor's degree, um, I 
didn't really know what kind of history I wanted to study because I never knew you could study really hit people on the ground. Uh, so I took a perspectives class, which everyone has to take. And we did the murder of Helen Jewett, who was um, a 19th century prostitute in New York who was murdered. And there was um, a whole sensationalized, um, it was a huge sensationalized murder. And uh, people were printing about it in the news and everything. And um, from there, I learned about brothel guides. And I've just been I guess obsessed, it could be the word, with them since then. So that's probably about six years. And I've, as I was learning and becoming a historian and learning how to think critically and differently, um, I knew I wanted to do something with them. And it made me start thinking of how men were perceiving these booklets. Mm -hmm. And from there, that's where I've moved on with this research. So tell everyone watching who's never seen one, what, what is a brothel guide? What's it look like? Or I mean, I'm sure they all look different in some way, but what are brothel guides? Um, they were small booklets, very tiny. I think I have, they're usually around three to five inches so that you could conceal them. And they consisted of listings of the brothels and sometimes prostitutes that were in town in the major cities. Um, and so you, if you were a come into town and you were a stranger you could get these guides from um you could get them from a peddler you could get them from hotels um sometimes like newsies were selling them uh and sometimes certain pu publishing places as well were selling them so you would you could get them and then you would know what they would tell you which brothels were safe to go to and which ones weren't also oh, they're actually like saying don't go to this brothel this one's like dirty yeah. <laughs> you know like lower lower rung brothel yeah. yes they'd be like you know this one's dangerous you don't know you know you could get raw there's instances of robbings that were happening mm. in them um so wow. you so, and they in the in, in the intro of most of them they pretty much tell you you know it's unsafe to move around the cities without this like you kind of need this and then some of them just didn't include the unsafe ones. So they pretty much say like, you know, if the brothel is not listed in this booklet, don't even worry about going to them. Wow. So this is like the mid 19th century Yelp review of yeah. brothels. Yes. Like <laughs> The star system, like this is five star and this one is <laughs> like a one. Yeah. Cause some of them would be like, you know, um, the earlier ones mostly, cause as you get a little later at the information, they don't have as much information in them. Mm -hmm. Um, the earliest one that, uh, I've looked at is from 1839 and that one has like the background stories of, so this woman was seduced and fall, fell into, you know, prostitution this way. And you get, and then you have like, this house is expensive or this one's moderately expensive. Um, so they have all these more background, deeper uh, facts. So, you know, so you think, you know what you're going into. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So they put like, like biographical sketches in some of them? Just in the, um, just in that first one. Okay. So as they go on later, they they'll tell you like there's maybe three or four girls in this or there's six or seven girls. Um, and then some of the later ones even talk about themed houses. So some houses are French themed. One has a house where it was, the women were either American, English or uh, Spanish. So you have your, if you know, your pick, if you have a preference. preference yeah. um, wow. Yeah. It, do these, do these kind of, uh, are certain ones appealing to certain strata of of men like uh, upper class or or is this just all across the board like it's it's kind of like whatever you fancy kind of thing well some of them um like some of them sell privacy and you can only get in if you were priorly invited or if you have like a certain card so i imagine that correlates to a higher price um other ones they yeah, the privacy. Um, and then you have ones that they talk about moderate prices and some of them are top prices. Um, one way that uh, other scholars have looked at uh, brothel hierarchy is in terms of what alcohol they're selling. So uh, Katie Hemphill in her latest book has just talked about how like, uh, if there is champagne, it's the highest type of brothel and then wine second level and then bottom is lower is beer 
<laughs> That's a low one. Okay. <laughs> We're more affordable. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's more more mainstream there. I yeah. Guess, uh, uh, so how does how does how do these guides kind of formulate as a historian the idea of American manhood or just manhood in general, the masculinity factor of it? How does this coincide with that thesis? Well, masculinity changed in the 19th century. Um, you have this, um, with the 19th century changing with the development of cities, um, you had all of these more uh, people populating the cities, young men were leaving their families in rural areas and now moving into the cities unsupervised. So you have like, organizations like the YMCA who are out there trying to teach young men or influence young men, self-restraint, modesty, um, and then you have these guides that are portraying something else. Uh, so you have all of this going on. And then these, so these spaces of brothels also were places of homosocial spaces where men could go and hang out with one another. Um, so allow them to move into these spaces, come be, um, hang out with one another, but also they could pretend to be living within these middle-class homes that were maybe unattainable to some of them because of financial situations. So the goal in the 19th century that you see common happening with monastery and restraint is this, these bourgeois um, expectation of middle-class men of being caretakers um, within their home. And then they could go, but sometimes that didn't happen. So they were able to act out that lack of, or um, that inability in within these brothels that were selling middle-class ideals. Were these uh, brothel guides, Brittany, were they also kind of like when you open up a, a newspaper, let's say, or something of the period, were they full of advertisements as well? Yes, uh, some of them, um, so, so one of them in particular in the back has uh, ads for uh, condoms, um, abortion medicine, uh, ads for other uh, sex books, so like marriage guides, um, and then they also, it also had um, sales for other brothel guides as well. And then another brothel guide at the end has another thing where you can mail in money to a certain house or to a certain PO box and then you would get uh, another brothel guide sent to you. Uh, we have uh, uh, questions already coming in because this is like fascinating to a lot of a, a lot of people and especially me I mean uh, uh, also me as well. Um, someone actually uh, asked did they rate the attractiveness of some of the workers in these? Yeah, some of them are like, you know, some of the, I was reading, just reading them over today. And one of them was like uncommon beauty. They're amazing. And then other ones were like, you know, they're average girls. <laughs> so, um, so they were, they did talk about rate them in some way or describe their beauty in terms of what they, what they weren't all gorgeous described. Were, were these published through like underground means underground publishing being done yes they were uh they were illegal um so and you see that within the 19th century is this um huge uh growth of illegal publications of illicit uh, print and so um we don't know who published um who published them because that information wasn't left anywhere in the book um, but I'm surmising that it was probably one of the um, one of the publishers that were publishing other forms of um, illicit print. And then you also had the flash papers, which were around the 1840s, um, that were these newspapers that were also kind of that were um, appealing to like the flashmen, sporting men who liked um, who enjoyed. Um, rich brothels were a part of that culture and gambling halls and uh, theaters and so they also would print like reviews of brothels and stuff like that in those papers as well that's that's pretty amazing yeah. <laughs> that this is all being done underground even though i guess that in many cases this is this trade legal in these in these places or is it because it's an underground publication is the are the uh, 
prostitution areas of prostitution is that illegal or are these coming out of places where it's legal no it, they were coming out of places that were illegal so uh, most of the so um the publishers like i look for new york for potential or for example because a lot of the guides are from new york um you had a lot of these um publishers who are uh, publishing um large uh amount of illicit books um, in the 19th century. Um, so flash papers, for example, were legal, but they were always under the publishers were always getting arrested because they would always push the boundaries of what was proper. Um, they were always getting libel laws pushed ag or against them because they were um, publishing uh, stuff that is deemed illegal. Um, so, for example, like one of the big publishing company or guys uh, was George Ackerman, and he um, what I because I just read uh, Donna Dennis's book, uh, Licentious New York. I think that's what it's called. Sorry, and um, she talks about him and how he uh, he was tired of he was trying to work around the law so that he wouldn't get arrested. So he had his newspaper offered it to people outside of New York only. And so, but then that means he had to edit in a way where it would be where people who were outside of New York would want to read it. Um, so that was how he worked around some of the laws until Anthony Comstock uh, created the Comstock laws in 1873 and then made sending illicit print through the mail illegal. Did they, uh, were there some of the guys that you located that were like, price ranges too, like price guides or were that was that done in house um they would say if the house was expensive um or the earlier ones would talk a little bit more about price uh as the guides go on they would talk more about the furniture and um i believe that's cues to give you an idea of how much maybe it was if like they're going on about like the nice pieces of furniture but then later in the last ones there's no prices at all Hmm. Is this is this kind of like when we when we associate it with masculinity in the 19th century, mid 19th century, or uh, American manhood, if you will, is this something that I guess uh, I don't know how to put it in, in a way. Is this something that men use and utilize to get uh, sexual experience before marriage, perhaps, or something like that, where they they gain their manhood through losing their virginity in these brothels or is this something that's just illicit on the side behavior what you found uncovering some of this i think it's a little bit of both i don't know if it's so much um in terms of a losing virginity thing uh but a lot of the time um because since they were homosocial spaces men could go there they could hang out and most of and some of them like the parlor houses had bars too so you could go there have a few drinks hang out with guys and you could discuss about maybe which women you drank you slept with um and then give maybe talk to the other men about stuff that you know other maybe give them suggestions about what women they should go with next time um i also read uh this great uh somewhat biography slash autobiography uh, of Nell Kimball. She was a prostitute in the late 19th century, turn of the turn of the 20th century. And she discusses um, about how some of her customers, they had to omit the names because their families were still alive, but how some of them were married men. And at one point she was a kept mistress for a married guy. And uh, I also think that the way the guides are are advertised or are portrayed. I think that it's something that um, married men could have been, were just as influenced as going as well. I think it was if a guy felt me unfulfilled at home for some reason, especially during a time when sexual suppression was was a big uh, thing that people were either aspiring to, thinking about um, within the 19th century for upper middle class. So you said about how you looked at guides clear back to the 1830s. Uh, what what was the date range approximately that you utilized for your research? If you had some back to the 1830s, what was the furthest forward you went to? 1880. So I had seven guides because not a lot of them survived. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. I've, never, I've never seen one like in, in the archives that I've 
been through and all that. I've never seen them. Are are some of them digitized or are they still just hard copy kind of things because you don't want some kids looking at these things? Two of them are actually um, digitized online. Um, uh, the Library Company of Philadelphia, they have one that's digitized online. If you go onto their um, if you go onto their website and you go into their search, um, it's one of like the two or three things that pop up. Uh, New York Historical Society also has one digitized, um, but it's di but they allowed the New York Times to have it digitized on their website. But if you just Google 19th century brothel guides, it's like the second or fourth links that those two pop up on. Yeah, you're gonna have to be careful what link you put. <laughs> you yeah, put and you make sure you have 19th century yes. because i've forgotten it <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's like i i i had a friend when i worked for the government and they wanted to look up wikipedia and the next day they looked up wikileaks oh. and it flagged their computer so yeah, you have to watch what you <laughs> what you type into your search engine yeah i did it at the Rutgers computers lab <laughs> oh, no. you get the blue screen of death well. uh that's amazing um there was a great question that came up here in the comments, and I'm I'm wondering if you had ever read of this throughout your your travels in the archives and looking these things up. Have you ever heard of the authorities using these against brothels, like saying, "Oh, now we know where this place is, and we can raid it," or or maybe they didn't want to because some of the police officers were using it. Um, <laughs> you know, have you ever heard of anything like that? I'm I'm wondering. No, um, because most of the time the authorities had an idea of where they were at, mm. of where the brothels already were. Um, this is more for people who are out of town visiting um, that maybe didn't know the area. Mm -hmm. How, uh, considering what you would find if you forgot to put in 19th century in your search engine for this stuff, how compared to uh, you know later stuff, how lewd is it? considered now compared to then like i'm sure it's lewd then because it's all underground but uh is it like demonstrably de demonstrably if i can get that out right um like over the top kind of you know stuff that's sensationalizing it or is it just like looking in a sears catalog kind of thing the later ones are more like looking into a sears catalog um the First one with the backstories, I wouldn't call, well, the first one tried to be passed off as a reform guide. Uh, <laughs> so the guide is dedicated to the suppression of onanism, which is masturbation. Uh, so it's like completely tongue in cheek. And when you open it, there's like this huge image of, um, of a naked woman. Um, and it, that one has a lot of the backstories of who seduced who, um, how these women fell into it. Um, but it's, I mean, by today's standards, it's still very tame. Um, were were these brothels that you've that you've found through these guides? Were they mostly run by women, or were they other women like madams, or were they run by men, or did was it? Each one was different. Was there a pattern? Um, most of them are all run by women. So really? prostitution was such, um, there was such limited um, job opportunities that really made women a lot of income in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. um, so being a madam, you, you usually gave, you know, gave, you were able to support yourself with that. So mostly women were, but a lot of the times, um, sometimes women were renting their houses from land, from their landlords and landlords, um, maybe sometimes were men. And then they, they usually were aware of what was going on with their rented property. Wow. That's awesome. What, uh, what was like the most shocking thing you found so far like the like the thing is like wow this is just absolutely insane or i never expected this to you know become a description of you know one of these houses or who's in it what was something where you're like i didn't expect to see this when i started this project <laughs> i don't know because i've been in it for so long <laughs> Plus you've probably seen a lot. I'm, so, I'm so numb to it <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah um i mean i just really 
I mean, getting to know more and more and getting, but also um, being able to continue to learn more from the previous historians who have looked at prostitution in the 19th century. Um, that doing that secondary research has allowed me to just look at the brothel guides more and more and in different in different ways and to really see uh, their influence. Yeah, that's something that's really awesome to think about. And I'm, I'm wondering, as they go forward, since you went up to the 1880s, do they transition from, let's say, drawings of women to photographs of women? Not the ones that I have looked at, but I know in like Storyville uh, with in New Orleans, um, they had blue books that were uh, similar to the bro to brothel. I mean, they were pretty much brothel guides, um, but they called them blue books. Uh, I don't, I haven't studied them too much. I like to stay within uh, New York and Philadelphia um, and also within the 19th century, but they included photographs. Mm -hmm. When you, when you read about some of the, uh, the brothels and those running these brothels, did you find any instances of where these madams had come up, I guess, through the ranks of, of being in the brothel to own a brothel or were they just kind of well to do right off the bat and they decided this is a good investment? That kind of um, information unfortunately doesn't really ring out in the guides um, simply just because um, sometimes the, the guides only list the madams and they don't list the women's names that were working for them. So you kind of lose that information. They'll just list the numbers of how many women were working for them, maybe a rough description if they were blue hair or if they were blue hair, brunette or <laughs> blonde. Um, but you don't really, but that happens. Um, that was one of the things that, you know, eventually down the line that some women were, were able to do. Not every, unfortunately, not every woman was able, that worked in um, prostitution was able to do that, but some did. So which one was better, Philadelphia or New York? I have more on New York, uh, and there's way more secondary sources on New York. So I always lean a little <laughs> heavier because um, of that information. Mm -hmm. That's that's awesome. It's it's something that is just we we tend to gloss it over because we think of them as being prim and proper and stuff like that. And then you see these guides and it's like, they're just like, they'd be on TikTok right now <laughs> going all, you know, or whatever. They'd be on Tinder every day. They'd be on TikTok every day and they would be doing this. What, what do you think we can learn from these as a whole about not only prostitution, but uh, sexual culture of the 19th century uh, stuff like that, other than saying they were exactly like us, <laughs> because it sounds like there's this instance where it's like, they're human. It's something like that. Yeah, I mean, um, one thing I, I mean, once you, you see with the 19th century is the progression of prostitution, but then eventually the decline of it by the end with the enforcement, with the laws cracking down more on brothels and houses, but also the culture changing um, in terms of how people start dating one another. Um, and in turn, and like there was, um, like women started doing things in the later half called like treating where guys would take them out to eat or do something like, you know, it's, it was like a date. And the expectation was that the woman would end the evening doing like uh, some kind of sexual fate or whatever um, to kind of in return for the date. Um, so, and those women didn't consider themselves within the frame of prostitution, but you start seeing just this changing and shifting with laws and culture that happens. Um, but one of the books I ended up reading this summer that was supposed to be just to move away from history, but made me actually look at this more, uh, was a book, um, on the Mustang Ranch that was in Nevada. And they were taught, and they did this one chapter about how these guys would go to the brothels and then go and do like an online forum and discuss like the practices within each brothel and which girls were great and which girls, you know, they didn't really care for it. And it made, and it, you know, brought that community together. And, um, but it made me think in another way of how that discussion may, ha may have happened with brothel guides in the 19th century. 
um, because like we really don't know who um, was writing them, but there's a lot of uh, research or scholarship on um, illicit print where women were blackmailed. Um, so sometimes the reviews, you know, maybe they weren't trustworthy because the women were blackmailed into paying or uh, maybe brothel owners um, funded certain guides. Uh, so that gives you all that different complex background that we just don't know. Did the did religious institutions try to intervene in these instances? Uh, with the bro um, in terms of brothels, yes, you had uh, like the Magdalene Society, and then you had the Rosine Association, who were both very big on trying to reform um, uh, women who were in who were sex workers. Um, so they would. And then some of even the Rosine associations would go to brothels and try to recruit women to join them. Um, and then they would, the goal for both of the organizations were take the women in, teach them a trade, and then they could, that were like considered moral work, and then you could, they could go out in a reformed life. Mm. But unfortunately, that was ignoring the financial situation that was going on, which is that women just weren't making enough money to support themselves during this time like they and they just weren't they weren't getting paid enough mm -hmm. were there any cultural changes or or um i don't know how it's put out in cultural changes involved in this as you go decade by decade like if you start in 1830s to the 1880s were there any shifts in in this uh i guess line of work or anything like that that was like, oh, I didn't expect that to occur, or was it pretty much stagnant across the board along with the guides themselves? With the guides themselves, it stayed pretty static. Um, the information changes though, like I said, the first one has the background, more information, and then the next guide has less background, just descriptions of the brothels, mm -hmm. girls, next one, same thing. And then you have this other one that's from 1870 from New York, it's a little bit different in how it's laid out in the beginning. It has the descriptions, but it reads more like a traveler's guide. Like you, it takes you through and it's like, well, after dark, you're walking through and you look good and you see this on your left and you look this on your right. And then it goes into describing the guides. So you can see how it was copying yet again, another form, um, which others, uh, scholars have talked about is this copying travel guides, which is another part of this middle class culture. So you see a lot of this adoption of these middle class ideals with the publication themselves, but also what they're trying to sell. Most of them, the houses that they are advertising that have good reviews are all these middle class homes. So they're trying, these women who are well polite, well spoken, they're ladies, um, the madams are sometimes described as mothers. So that makes you think of, well, the madam's the mother, the girls are her daughter. So, you know, it's like a dating feel, or it's like, it gives you this idea of a house rather than a, uh, a brothel where you're going and spending money on a, on a, t a type of consumer good. When you talked about how they would go over this house has, you know, brunettes and, or, uh, you know, these people of uh, these ethnic backgrounds or whatever, were there any ones that were like, uh, were there any women who were, I don't want to say prized because I don't want to demean these women, but it's just like, were there any ones who, um, you know, were like, what they considered like top tier women of the time and some were lower or was it kind of like whatever the fantasy was of the man that's what was in the guide uh because you, we talked about how there weren't prices put in there but there was kind of like okay it's the furniture it's the environment it's the it's uh the middle class lifestyle of the location were there any women who were considered like the the top of the I hate to put it like that, but like the top of the line kind of uh, person in a brothel or was it kind of just a universal thing within these guides that it was a similar level? No, I mean, some women, you know, some places were prized as like top notch. This is a spectacular home with amazing women. Some are like, it's okay. It's, you know, they're like, it's not bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, 
I mean, some places are deemed higher um, than other places um, and the description of women were the same way. Um, some places are just like, they're like, don't even, don't step foot in there. It's dangerous. Um, I think one place was described as like a den of like, it's just some places were really horribly written off. Yeah. Did you find that uh, the Civil War era changed how, how these were seen at all? I don't know if you saw any from the 1860s or anything like that that may have been found in your travels. But I'm wondering if that changed the um, outlook of the guides or they became more numerous or, or whatever else, because word of mouth is getting around in Philadelphia and New York when there are troops in town, you know, everyone's talking. So uh, does that change at all in, the, in that period? Because it's about 30 years after your first, the one you first found. I'm not exactly, I've not seen anything like that. Um, I know to bring up um, Katie Hempel's latest book again, uh, she talks about how prostitution was affected in Baltimore with the Civil War um, and how women were working um, with different soldiers to pass off different information um, and stuff like that. But I didn't see anything in, that the guides really changed in telling in that kind of, in that regard. Did you ever find any stories of, let's say, prominent men getting caught up in these as you were going through? I know you're, you're strictly talking about guides and, and such, but uh, through your research, um, uh, you know, if, if there was any kind of stories or something or something that landed in the newspaper where someone was caught, you know, and it was like, wow, this person's like a, you know, a city chairman of something or a mayor or a, whatever it may be. Did you ever find anything like that where they're, they're caught up in some kind of a, a thing like that? Or is that kind of just under the rug? You know, it's fine. Most of the time men were able to get out of, most of the time men, um, like when, during brothel raids or stuff, men were able to get out um, uh, and get without notice. Um, but some of the guides talk about how there's like this, they offer a lot of privacy. So I imagine that means for men who are of a higher status, more to lose within society, need to keep the what they're doing on the side a secret, um, then those are the places to go. Uh, and then, like I said, Nell Kimball's book, she talks about um, the guy that kept her as a mistress. Um, he was married and he was she, like she had to admit his name but um he was a higher end guy and that when his wife found out or when he when he was almost exposed but he had so he paid her off throughout most of her life to kind of keep it a secret hmm. um and i think in the maybe but i think in uh the flash press um there is scholarship on there's a book on that and I think they talked about how some how they're with the libel cases a lot of the time blackmail those flash papers were notorious for blackmail where they would threaten to print something they knew about someone um so it was it was going on <laughs> right right especially if they're saying you know it's a very secretive place you know and no one talks there's no there's no snitches here yeah. kind of a thing going on uh you know snitches get stitches so you don't want <laughs> that um the the other thing that um once someone brought up which you know as as my brand is you know getting out to some people who just conduct a lot of hardcore research uh what was the research process like for the for this presentation for you um, it was a lot of secondary sources, um, but also trying to think of how the guides related to the middle class um, and other ways, like how are they, because that's the one thing is that these guides are trying to sell, because all of the listings where they want you to go are these houses, these realms of middle class. Um, and I kind of, and um, it started with uh, Katie Hemphill has an article in, um, I think it's Capitalism by Gaslight, uh, where she talks about how brothels change in the 19th century and no longer become these strict places of transaction, but now these realms of domesticity um, where these women are middle-class women. And so 
that is apparent in all of these guys. Like they're the women that you want to go to that they're selling are these middle class women who can speak well, hold a conversation. So I was just, it's just started thinking about manhood and how that was set, how they sold that to men. And so I just, from there, it was a lot of secondary sources on mass reading the sources on masculinity, which was so much fun because I've always studied femininity. So it was great to get into the minds of men. Um, and from there, I was able to see what kind of fantasies and worlds they wanted to escape and how they were living. Well, being inside a man's head can be scary. <laughs> but, um, uh, but but it is it is fascinating. It's it made me appreciate not only not only what you were going to talk about this evening here with us uh, at the current time, but other things that I've read has really made me think more about uh, the history of this masculine ideal. Um, uh, one of the books that I remember in undergraduate that I read was on. Uh, the idea of masculinity during the Spanish American war mm. and how propaganda was used to pump up this masculine ideal of the American male and the, the American male goes over and, and helps those less fortunate to become, you know, uh, uh, basically to colonize is what it was, what it was about. And, and it was that idea at the time. And that was the idea of manhood. So this goes right into that in, in, the, in, in my mind, you know, this was in a previous sense, but in a, a very different, but yet really cool uh, background on that. Uh, when you were preparing for history camp and you were thinking about your presentation for that, what was that kind of like one, one part of your presentation or one line that you knew it was going to get people's attention? You were like, oh, this is going to be the one. Oh, I don't. I don't know, but really? the one section that I really have fallen in love with this paper is looking at how the guides are speaking to this, um, how is speaking to this guy who either aspires to be middle class or is feeling insecure about his manhood and wants, you know, it to feel stronger or, um, this man that maybe is part of the middle class and it's not what he expected. And that always makes me think of the background of the design. So the later ones look like almost like visiting cards when you open it. And I just think of a guy like opening up a guide and he's seeing like all of these women's calling cards, like begging him to come and him feeling like desired, but also thinking like maybe the background of who made those guides or maybe a male publisher who's wishing himself that all these women were um, desiring him or they were his wife because their some of the publishers wives were involved with the printing and designing as well so maybe it's a woman just thinking oh a guy would just maybe want to be called on so it makes me think of just was that background of you know just that guy's desire and then also who was who was insinuating that in the background so wives were involved, these publishers, wives were involved in publishing some of them or helping to design them or? Yes, yeah, some is like, really? the, like the printing and stuff. Yeah. Okay. To make it more of a, a feminine appeal of the guide? Um, I over. think it was part of, and I, I may be, it's mm -hmm. a little gray in the, in the head, but um, I think it was part, like, part of like women's work is like the painting. So like the block, like the one image in the guy is like a block work black work image of the woman that's nude and um, it could have been a woman painting that who ha could get into the small spots wow that's that is pretty awesome <laughs> um what uh where do you see this going would you like to uh further enhance this or would you want to make this into a, a monograph do you want to use this for just further research uh where would you like to see this go or are you going to something completely different now <laughs> i would love to see this completed like i said this is, brothel guides is a it's been a very long time coming i've changed the thesis several times just as my as i've evolved as a historian and looking at different ways and more complex ways and being able to put it within the context of other scholarship um so i would love to see this as a completed article <laughs> um and then from there, 
who knows, but at least have it published as an article and that would be, that's the dream. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I'm sure that that dream will come true because that's that's just- <laughs> Thank you. Shit. I'm, I'm serious, that's, I'm thinking like monograph, I'm thinking like book <laughs> form here and you're going for just article and I'm like, oh yeah, that's, that's gonna happen, that won't be an issue. Because I think that um, we're seeing an, an uptick in gender studies now uh, more than ever in my opinion and i'm just one opinion obviously but i see that more than ever and this is going towards uh not only you know the issue of masculinity but also femininity at the same time so you're crossing that that you know threshold where it's like you could be appealing to either side of the equation with this especially when it comes to like madams and and things like that with femininity uh it's definitely going to be an article, Brittany. That's not going to be. Thank you. <laughs> you got that, sister. Don't worry <laughs> about that. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm so glad that you got to hang out for a while with us. I've been looking in the comments, and there's a lot of great comments in there for you to look over uh, <laughs> later on. And, some, and uh, I tried to go over as many questions as I could. Someone actually asked if you're going to pursue your PhD. Um, and so they're, would... they're, they're ready for well... you. <laughs> I would love to go back and hopefully one day I will get to, that's the dream, but yeah, yeah. further down the line. <laughs> further down the line. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're definitely, they're definitely interested in what you have to say and all this in this talk. And I'm so glad that we got the opportunity to bring you on because I've felt bad for everyone who's, who's had a conference canceled on them or a presentation canceled. I know what that's like to have a presentation canceled. Um, and I'm so glad that, we got a chance to bring you on to give us an introduction to this uh, because it's it's so deserving of it. And also that, you know, you need to have this out there because you need to get that book written. <laughs> Thanks for having me. This is yeah. so much fun. <laughs> well, you're welcome. You're welcome. I'm glad this was your first one you said, and I'm glad that, uh, yeah. that you didn't pass out. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm so glad that you were able to come on, Brittany, and do this because it's really important for us to get this research out there to as many people as possible. And uh, I know that for, for those of you watching as well, uh, before we sign off here in a few minutes, uh, I did put uh, the speaker's tip jar up in the description because uh, historians, as you know, have all kinds of uh, subscriptions to uh, different things. Uh, such as but not limited to newspapers.com and, and jstor and things like that so there's no pressure at all i don't want you to say that so uh that's up there but uh Brittany, again thank you so much for coming on here and doing this or is, is there anything that you would like to say to uh that we haven't covered that you think is something cool to go out with or or do you think we've <laughs> done a good job no i think this was great <laughs> thank you so much you're very welcome and i'm and i want to point out to everyone before we log off to that uh i quote met Brittany because i just checked out her instagram and saw that we can network and make this work and allow people like Brittany and, and other people coming up on the 20th of june to utilize this platform to get the word out about what they research so hard with and hard and 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 you know spent a lot of hours on uh because of the conferences being canceled and this this trying time we're going through so i'm glad that out of a little bit of networking and some direct messages we came up with a you know a killer format for tonight a killer subject and i'm so glad that you were on Brittany. thank you so much you're welcome thank you everybody for watching i hope you have a wonderful night i'll see you all tomorrow night so take care everybody Bye.